Okay, we will uh, begin, but before we do, I just want to remind everyone that our, our board meeting is uh, live streamed and on YouTube, so if you are going to say something, please come up to the microphone so everybody can hear. And with that, we'll call the meeting to order and rise for the pledge. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Public forum. Does anybody here wish to speak at public forum? Nobody. We'll move on to the agenda. Any changes? Uh, no changes or additions to the agenda, Mr. Chair. I'll move the agenda. I second it. Motion by Ludwig, second by Lovgren. Any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, uh, Reese, just so everybody knows, Reese is uh, on sick leave. And he will join us, uh, you know, so if we have questions during the public hearing, he'll be uh, coming in via um, uh, interactive TV. We'll move on to approval of the minutes of the August 15th uh, County Board uh, minutes and summary for publication, August 22nd special meeting, Committee of the Whole for budget and the August 29th special meeting Committee of the whole for budget. I move the minutes. I'll second. Uh, motion by Lovegren, seconded by Waldham. Uh, any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, minutes of the uh, reports. Uh, all we have is the county surveyor monthly report for August. I'll move that. I second it. Motion by Moore, second by Lovegren. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? We'll move on to the consent agenda. Uh, you've had that in front of you for a while. So, anybody has any questions? I'll move consent, Mr. Chairman. I second it. Second. Second. And a motion by Lovegren or Ludwig, seconded by Lovegren. Any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? That brings us up to our regular agenda. And first on the agenda is the cannabis ordinance, public health, uh, or public, public health, public hearing to be held uh, right now. And uh, so, presentation by staff is what Mr. we have first. Mr. Chair, members of the board, um, on August 1st, the use, possession, and growing of cannabis within certain limits for those 21 or older became legal. Adults over 21 can use cannabis outside in public places, such as parking lots, sidewalks, and parks. State law prohibits smoking at any location where a minor could inhale the smoke. Under the new state law, local governments such as counties may adopt an ordinance restricting the use of cannabis in public spaces. The ordinance as drafted would prohibit the use of cannabis in a public place or a place of public accommodation. Uh, these terms are defined in sections 2G and 2H of the ordinance, uh, but they, they're, they're somewhat self-descriptive. Um, the exceptions are covered in section 2I. The ordinance does not apply to a private residence, to private property unless prohibited by the owner or at an establishment or event license to permit on sale consumption. If there are other exceptions uh, that the commissioners would like to consider, such as the memorial forests, uh, any other exceptions could be added in section 2I as well. Uh, additionally, since this is a county ordinance, it does not apply within the corporate limits of cities or within state parks or state forests. This ordinance also does not regulate the licensing of commercial cannabis related businesses. Uh, I would now like to invite Sam Lowe, Director of Pine County Public Health, uh, to speak on the health impacts of secondhand marijuana smoke. 
Hello. I'm going to keep this super brief because none of this should be a surprise to anybody what I'm about to say. Uh, so there's a couple things we are just worried about in terms of public consumption of cannabis. Uh, one, as Dave mentioned, is the secondhand smoke. And that's true for both youth as well as adults. If people are not actively intending to smoke it, which is not great for your lungs anyway, that secondhand exposure, it, you get the same impact on your lungs in terms of particulate matter in your lungs and that impact that can have. So just not ideal. Oh, my phone closed. Here we go. Um, second, around normalizing the behavior, um, it is going to become more normalized, but kiddos seeing that is just not ideal. We want them to not find it the super normal thing that everybody just does. Um, so just keeping it out of the public space will help limit that exposure as much as, you know, we can. Uh, public impairment, I'm going to lean on the sheriff's office way more for that one, but don't love that because, you know, as much as you don't want to see somebody drunk walking down the street, you don't want to see somebody high walking down the street. Like, stay home. And then the last piece would just be unintentional ingestion by children. So just having it more in the public space just increases the risk of kiddos potentially having access to everything from the plant to edibles to whatnot. So just the more we can do to just try and keep it home, safe, away from kiddos is just good for kids and grownups. So any questions from a public health perspective on public use of cannabis, happy to answer. And just one more comment on the staff uh, presentation that violation of the ordinance is a petty misdemeanor uh, with up to a $300 fine. Thanks, Al. Thanks, Sam. Anybody else? No, no. Um, that's that's it for the staff presentation for now, and so we'll uh, turn it over to the county board for questions and discussion. Anybody? I, I think the only thing, because I raised it last time and I've been giving it some thought, it's the Memorial Forest site. Yeah, I, I do. And, and I, if I understand it correctly, the state forests, uh, we have no control over. So uh, I would think our Memorial Forest would fall into that same, I mean, I. I I'm looking back here towards Jeff because he's, I don't know if that's a harder thing to police or take care of than, you know, if they're out here in the parking lot smoking versus out in Shangwatana. Mr. Chair? Yes. So I know what, originally I thought, why would we, when my comments were, why would we exempt, or why would we put the ordinance in the memorial forest? And then I was thinking about it since then, and, and um, you know, the argument like you can drink in them or whatever isn't isn't really the same, you know, because uh, that goes in your body and the smoke doesn't go in your body. Because sometimes you could have other people in the memorial forest too than the smoke is there. So, and then the other thing I think about is like you know you can't have alcohol in a park either, right? But Everybody has alcohol in the park, and it, it it so what happens with that from at least in my background that there is discretionary, right? For if but but if the law is there and then there is a problem out in the memorial memorial forest or in a state park for that, then the officers that respond somewhere have a tool that they can use. So, um, I guess what I'm trying to say, if we leave it in there. It's probably going to be harmless unless there's a it's complaint driven, and there's an issue. And then if the officer or our our officers have to respond, at least they have a tool in their toolbox to do something about it. So I, I kind of changed where I was because of that. I think because um, they'll still use their discretion no matter where they go. You know, if there's nobody around or whatever, but they don't have to write a ticket. They can do warnings or something like that. So I don't know. Maybe Jeff, if that. Does that fit for you, something yeah, like that? Yeah, Mr. Chair, members of the board, that is kind of where I've been the whole time. So, again, I'm not suggesting that we make laws to make laws or make laws that we ignore, but I think the right. deputies on the scene have discretion 
and the ability to use discretion if there is a petty misdemeanor that might attach to it as well. So uh, my stance now is the same as it's been. I don't know that it's going to ever be enforced, uh, but at least having a tool, uh, something we can fall back on instead of just saying, you know, there's nothing. That's just a bad answer. Yeah. Um, but if we have something we can work with, it, it does help us do that. Thank you. That, that helps. So when I was reading this, the whole thing that I kept thinking was hearing Jeff say, if we have something to stand on, you know, it will be a benefit to the department. And so that's that's where I'm at is this will give them that leg to stand on. So thank you for going through that. Mr. Chair. Yeah. Uh, do we, is it legal in a state forest? Or is... I think it's, yes, it would be. Uh, last, Mr. Chair, members of the board, last I heard a like, month or so ago, the DNR was reviewing what it was going to have for rules, oh. and I, I just don't know. I, I think we're in a, I think we're in a year-long learning curve here, um, and so we'll, uh, we'll probably we'll probably do something and come back in a year and, and maybe have to do something different. But I think uh, we're, we're gonna try to do the best we can with the information we have at time at, mm -hmm. at hand right now. Mr. Chair, yeah. is, so is, it the, is it the smoke, secondhand smoke thing you're thinking of or the fire chance of like burning a forest down? Because can you- oh, It could be both. Can you, can you smoke cigarettes in a- Yeah. Yeah, you can smoke cigarettes out there, so yeah. that's already. Yeah. I mean, so you'd have to, I would think, then ban people from well, having a cigar when they're out celebrating shooting that big buck. Then you can't do that. Then. No, I agree. Yeah. It, it would be, but I, that's why I say it. It would probably never be an issue. Mm -hmm. But if you, but it's nice. And I see that's the argument. You know? Yeah, you know, and then there's other means. I mean, yeah, you know, alcohol is usually mm -hmm. consumed drank there's other means of of enjoying your cannabis right isn't there edibles i mean right there's other so you're right it's yeah not, you know because it's a yeah, legal substance it'd right? be more towards jeff how I do you know. i was there too i know when they're under the influence is really the thing then yeah but but that's why i, I came down where it's like it, it probably wouldn't be a problem to see you'll get a group of atv or somewhere camping and it's all hell breaks loose and the cops get called in and then they just have a tool. Otherwise, who would, it would never be. It'd be complaint driven. <clears throat> and it's like, we have to start somewhere. And if it yeah. looks like it's a problem, we can fix it just as quick. So they invented, they invented the vape because of the smoke. And then people didn't like the vape because it looks like smoke. You know? yeah. Chemicals are still there. And yeah. to me, there is a difference between tobacco and and marijuana smoke in that you know marijuana is more psychoactive and, and does affect your brain perhaps more than nicotine does. So I think there is a difference in tobacco and marijuana and the secondhand smoke exposure. Thank you, ma'am. Any more questions? If not, we'll open it up to the public. If anybody from the public has a comment. Welcome up now. I can see throngs of people approaching the podium. <laughs> but if we have nobody, that's fine. In that case, we'll close the public hearing part of it. And the board has questions. Reese is online if somebody has a question of his opinion, but my only comment is we should periodically revisit the ordinances anyway as a board, right? Right. So we, we can just say we're going to do that. So I think we're down to the point that if we want to consider the ordinance 2023-40, uh, at this point, Mr. Chair, yes, does the ordinance um, 
that we have, does that include the memorial for us or not? Yes. It does. Okay. okay. Yeah. So this one does. All right. Um, with that, then I would uh, make a motion for ordinance 2023-40. It does include that you cannot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll second this motion. I just wanted to make sure I yep. answered. That's maybe that. I didn't say that. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying. Yeah, we got a motion by Moore, second by Love. Is there any more discussion? Yeah, the discussion, the Memorial Forest, is that looked at the same as the, the state forest then? Because you can do this in a state forest or not? State will have their own ordinance. David was just saying that the state's still looking at it. They haven't come through with what they're going to do with that yet it's, so we could actually be then more restrictive than the state if the state doesn't do anything and they're under state park state forest yes we could be it can't be less restrictive but you can be more yeah then i would can i amend the motion saying that i would like to leave this memorial forest until we see what the state does josh would have to amend that one too because he made the motion I and the reason I did it is just because I I think it's a good idea to have it that way. Um, technically, you can drink alcohol in Memorial Forest, and you can't on the state. So, um, but I'm assuming they're gonna come right along with it. So that's I like giving the sheriff's department if there is an issue, they can enforce something. So, and if it creates a problem, we can always amend it later. Sure. I want to, I'll leave it the way it is. For me. I appreciated the fact too, that Jeff had said that they're not going to go out there looking for people that are doing it, but if they do have a complaint, then they've got something to stand by. I, based on the amount of uh, input that I've had from the public, I'm guessing this isn't the top issue in the county. And, uh, I, I think we're, we'll take the lead. I, I don't know. It, it sounds like a pretty good thing to, to help our law enforcement at this point until we, until we know what's really going on. And maybe in six months, we'll know a lot more and we can come back and, and change this. Anyway, any more discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Thanks. Thanks, David and Sam. Yep. Health and Human Services Advisory Committee minutes are attached. Terry, wanna, we kind of covered most of that in our budget meeting. Mm -hmm. It was a good meeting, though. Or not, Terry, I mean, Matt. <laughs> Sorry. We knew. <laughs> but I, I'd like to add that I did reach out to, um, because we are going to be bringing this stuff up at the Association of Minnesota Counties, um, what our needs are as far as public health. And I reached out to Sam and Becky, and I just want to, appre I appreciate your quick response and thoroughness on your responses, and um, it will be supported. <laughs> so thank you for that. I appreciate it. Uh, then we'll move on to Operation Community Connect update. That is me. Um, good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board. My name is Becky Foss. I'm the director of Pine County Health and Human Services. And it is a pleasure and an honor to be here today just um, offering a brief recap of the 2023 Pine County Operation Community Connect. Um, we call it OCC, so that's the acronym we'll be using today. Um, the event, the OCC, was hosted this year um, by Pine County Health and Human Services and the United Way of Carleton County. And don't be fooled by that name. They also serve Pine County um, United Way. Um, we held it at the Hinkley Finlayson High School. So the next time you see your school partners from Hinkley Finlayson, give them a big thank you because their venue was amazing and it was able to fit all the vendors we had. And that was a real concern. Um, additionally, it was a nice place to have a catered meal from a local vendor. So just a beautiful space. Cannot thank Hinkley Finlayson enough for that. 
Um, this year was a little different in that we held our OCC in August versus October. And the goal of that was really to support children and families um, by being available in the summer before they were going to school and offering some back to school resources like backpacks. Um, the PTOs in the area have school supplies kind of covered, but we figured backpacks and we heard backpacks was a real need in the area. Um, so that was um, something we had done with the goal of having um, 200 community members or more show up. Um, previously, we had anywhere from 150 to 175. Very happy to report that we had over 300 community members um, show up for the OCC, and we had over 50 vendors. Um, and the beauty of the vendors is they were local and regional resources for the community, ranging from financial assistance to mental health to chemical health um, to dental health. So just a nice array of all the services and resources that somebody may be looking for at an event like that. Um, we had free haircuts offered as well. Um, there's some connections in house to a hairstylist, so that is helpful. So that was donated to us, which is really nice. Or I should say the time was um, not a physical donation. Um, we also had a steering committee this year because we knew um, things were changing. And because of the time change in from October to August, um, it really put health and human services more in a driver's seat role. Um, previously, the United Way was, we were co-facilitators, but the United Way really drove most, most of that with um, some help from health and human services. And we flipped that this year to, it was mostly driven by health and human services staff with facilitation by United Way. Um, so I wanted to give um, a quick shout out to the members of the OCC steering committee. Um, those were led all the time by Haley Friedland, who's just an awesome public health educator. Um, public health educators Krista Jensen and Janae Hicks were also part of the steering committee, as well as Cassandra Olson, myself, um, Michelle Gruel, Lisa Stoffel, and then Sarah from the United Way. We had um, various um, financial sponsors as well, including many area alliance groups, the Pine City one, the Pine Area, the Sturgeon Lake, um, the, the Finless and Geezy Lions, Essential Health and Sandstone also offered us a huge grant. So that was really helpful in providing a meal to the community. Um, Medica and UCARE were also there. So just wanted to give that brief update and talk about the success that it was. Thank you. I heard Becky. really good things about it, Becky. <laughs> it was amazing. They did a great job. 300 people? Yep, 305 to be exact. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Essentia Health uh, report for the fiscal year 23. Thanks for coming. Yes. Alrighty, so my name is AJ Skochinski. I'm our EMS supervisor for our sandstone operation, which would encompass the vast majority of Pine County. So this last physical year, our physical year at Essentia starts July 1st, ends June 30th each year. Um, our sandstone operation, we were responded to a little over 4,300 responses last year, which compared to FY21 was a 14% increase. Um, it's our largest multi-year increase we've seen. We currently operate three bases in Pine County on a permanent basis. Um, our sandstone base, which is right next to the sandstone hospital, our Hinkley base, which is inside the Hinkley fire station, and our Pine City base, which is a few hundred yards behind the board. So inside that service area, we have portions of three different counties. We have Aiken County, we cover one township in, we cover the northern part of Caneva County, and then between our sandstone operations and our Moose Lake operations, we cover all of Pine County, with the exception of the immediate area around Brook Park and areas west of Highway 107. We do have the county jail here. Um, we also cover the federal facility up in Sandstone. We cover Grand Casino and all the portions of the casino there. Um, the Mille Lacs tribal properties out on the eastern part of Pine County and then three state forests. Um, just in our Sandstone operations, we have 70 miles of interstate. When you add our Sandstone and our Moose Lake operations together, it's about 70 miles of interstate we cover. So our makeup at Essentia Health EMS, all our ambulances um, are one leadership team now. So we have bases out in Ada, Minnesota, which covers almost all of Norman County, Detroit Lakes, Boston, our Deer River operations, um, and our newest base to us right now is our Buell operations um, up between Hibbing and Virginia. We have two medical directors. Our primary medical director is Dr. Chris Anderson. He's a division chair for emergency services at Essentia. Um, he's based in Fargo, and we do have a new associate medical director to us this last year. His name is Brandon Dravich. Um, if you've ever been to the Sandstone ED, he's one of the ED docs that's fairly frequent um, down in the sandstone area. 
So he does come out and do some ride-alongs with crews on the east side of Minnesota. So he's been out here with me a couple days and done some ride-alongs. Uh, we currently have seven ambulance licenses throughout Minnesota. We have nine base locations. We have about 150 EMS clinicians. So that's EMTs, paramedics, and a couple emergency medical responders. We have six community paramedic locations now. Um, they would be in Brainerd, Fargo, Detroit Lakes, Ada, Deer River, and Duluth. So that's our biggest growth lately has been in our community paramedics. Um, all, all in all, throughout all of Century EMS, we did about 13,000 responses last year. We have one centralized billing office, which is based in Brainerd, Minnesota. Um, our billers do work remotely, though. So we have an interfacility dispatch center out of Duluth, so they coordinate all our interfacility medical transports for us. Um, that's been a big change. It's very nice. So instead of having five of our sites get a phone call from a hospital about a transfer, they call one location and they can find the closest ambulance or the ambulance that's going to be there soonest. We used to, in years past, drive past each other on highways, going to transfers opposite directions. Um, and we, right as of today, we have 23 ambulances in our fleet. I ask you a question. Yeah. Um, six community paramedic locations. What exactly does that mean? So our community paramedics, and Mitch might be able to expand more here, um, our community paramedics, they are focused on acute care post-ER discharge or post-hospital discharge. So their goal is to decrease the workload on a system. So a patient that's a comes into an ER frequently, um, they can be assigned a community paramedic to help them. Um, they'll out do a home visit, like a safety assessment, help organize medications. Um, and then sometimes when they get out to a home, you know, if you have a COPD patient, it might get there and realize, okay, you have a bunch of asbestos in your house. This is something we should look at or the, your home environment isn't the greatest for healing. Um, we do have a program out in Fargo right now. Is hospital in the home still open? Hospital in the home is a program that started this last year. Um, it's been a trial out there where we actually admit patients to their house. Um, and a community paramedic stops out multiple times a day. They're generally low acuity patients. They're not high acuity. So instead of taking that med spurge space up and cutting down, you know, a nurse, if they have a one to six ratio, that allows one more patient with a higher acuity to be admitted. Um, and they've had really good success with it. One hard thing with community paramedics, there's not a lot of them out there. The program started in 2013, um, and it's been very slow, and COVID really slowed it down further. Um, I think there's 180 community paramedics in Minnesota, and we employ roughly 10 or 12 of them. Okay, thank so. you. How does that work? Does the does the ER doc then say you go? Do they put it on the release that, and then you guys get notified to do a follow up at the home? I'm not directly related to our community paramedic program, so I don't want to speak on their behalf on every aspect. Um, but they can do referrals to them, um, and that's why you know a lot of our community paramedic programs aren't in areas we have ambulance services unless we have a hospital and an ambulance service. Um, other ambulance providers in Minnesota have tested doing community paramedics with their ambulance. Um, they have a lack of connection there because they don't have access to their patient care reports um, for hospital data for Epic. So there's a lack there. And community paramedics, it's a, it's a losing proposition. You're going to lose money in them and a lot of money. It's just what you're going to save on the re-emit costs um, and all the extra fees that come with it. So they're, they're a cost saver, not a cost maker by any means. Nice thing about the community paramedics, though, is if you have someone with a shoulder injury, getting later in their career and wants to stay involved, it's a great way for them too. And they can use their years of experience to help people long-term. So some advancements and some patient care changes we've done in the last year, year and a half. We purchased a new ambulance. It's actually the ambulance that's in Hinkley. I forgot to attach a photo when I sent the PowerPoint over, but it's a box style ambulance. It's got a Ford front end on it. It was about a $205,000 investment in the community. And then this October, we're expecting a uh, remount of an ambulance. So one of it was one of our other ambulances. We sent it down North Carolina. They take the box of the ambulance off the truck and pretty much strip it down to the bare metal and replace everything in it and put it on a brand new chassis. Let's put a $50,000 cost savings by doing it that direction. That's supposed to be back here in October, hopefully. Um, there's been a huge backlog of ambulances. It used to be a six to eight week window we used to have when we bought ambulances. We're now getting quoted 1,100 days by a new truck. Um, so this ambulance that's coming back, I sent down there in March of 22. It was supposed to be six to eight weeks. I'm just getting it back. Oh, wow. So, But the truck was ready for it. It had almost 400,000 miles on it. We, we got every mile we could. One other thing we did that was probably one of our biggest operational changes is we integrated with both Pine and Carleton County um, for access to their computer aid dispatch. Um, so all our crews have iPads in the vehicle now, and they can see where the other trucks are at, the calls. They can see the dispatcher notes of a call. So one thing that we did lose when the Pine County went to the encryption route was we didn't get that connection as much of all the updates. So we were able to get a lot of that back now by seeing CAD notes. So that's been extremely helpful for our crews. 
that was about a ten thousand dollar investment when everything was said and done between the ipads the mounts we had to update um, our routers internet connectivity in some of our trucks that were scheduled to get trained like replace the next few years. We had to do those a little earlier than we thought, but that's been a great system. Um, there's still some room for improvement there for us, um, but it's it's been working well. Other big change we did is we changed our patient care reporting. Our crews have for five years now did all their patient care charting on iPads. Um, the NEMSIS it's called, which is a national organization in the United States that's they collect all EMS data and tell states what they have to obtain. And then the states tell us what we have to tell them. Um, they set their standards to change come the end of this year. We decided to go about six months early on that, um, which is great. It was great being one of the first services, the first service in Minnesota to transition and one of the first services to switch. Um, the challenging part is our legacy data now is very hard to correlate. Um, we used to talk about how often we transported someone versus how often we went to a call. One question that we used to ask for that is now four questions. So it's a lot harder to compare year to year now. Um, with that, though, we took the opportunity to change it. So our crews now, they walk into patients' homes with their iPads in their hand, and they start documenting right away. Um, as soon as we obtain information, we start documenting as fast as we can. Um, it's patient care, point of care documenting. Gives us better data in so we can get better data out. And then we're working on the integration with our hospitals around us so we can start sending that data early to them. On most of our encounters, it's not going to change a lot of things. But a stroke patient is a great example of that where we show up to a hospital, a lot of times they won't CT these patients until they have their demographics, allergies, medications, and have a history of them. We can send that early now. So we revised all our medical guidelines. We used to use protocols, um, which were very black and white. You must do this, you cannot do this. We changed that terminology throughout our entire guidelines to the word guideline. They're there to guide our crews. Um, our new medical direction team very much believes that paramedics should be paramedics and allowed to use their knowledge and expertise in the field to treat people the best they think is possible. So that created about 500 changes throughout our guidelines, which was quite a bit. With that, we did an, we increased our EMT scope of practice. They now can treat uh, our diabetic patients with dextrose IV versus before we had to give a really expensive medication in your arm and it had about a 50-50 chance of that working. Um, we've added our paramedic scope of practice greatly. We've actually changed our titles, our paramedics, to paramedics specially trained now to recognize the work that they do and the extra care that they're able to provide. We added the medication called Droperidol this last year to our truck, um, which is used in our behavioral health emergencies. Helps with their agitation and combativeness patients a lot. We added TXA to our ambulances. Um, that's for our major trauma patients or our pregnant folks post-delivery. That's TXA is fairly common in Minnesota. Um, Droperidol were one of the few services using it. TXA is common though. We also added nicardipine, which is normally like a very critical care ICU, like big centers administer nicardipine. Um, we use that with our stroke patients to help safely lower their blood pressure instead of just rapidly decreasing it. We also added IV Tylenol, um, which doesn't seem like that would be a big thing. I don't know another service in Minnesota using IV Tylenol. We use this for our sepsis care. Our docs come from our sepsis program. So there's some great discharge data on that. And also it provides us another route of controlling pain without using opiates. And then our dextrose 10% solution for our EMTs. We replaced all our radios in our trucks, um, our vehicle mounted radios and all our portable radios. Um, so we replaced eight vehicle mounted radios, 25 portables. Um, when we added Moose Lake into our operation, we found that between Carleton and Pine County, our crews had different layouts in their radios, and none of the crews down here could talk to anything else unless they were in Pine County. So if we would have 911 call in Canavac County, they couldn't talk to them. If they did a 911 call in Canavac or Carleton, they couldn't talk. So we took the time. We talked to all the sheriff's offices around us. We got new letters permission to authorize us to talk in all these talk groups, and we made it into one layout. So it doesn't matter if a crew member's from Deer River and comes to Sandstone today to work. The radio layout's the exact same. Their guideline layouts are now the exact same. Um, and then the other one with that is their IDs. Um, so when I key up my radio back here, it'll actually show up and dispatch their call sign. Even if they can't have the ability when they hit the emergency button to say their call sign or where they're at, it allows the dispatcher to know who actually was the one who activated that alarm now. So our recruitment and staffing, this has been our biggest focus the last year and a half. We have done an internal scholarship for any of our EMTs that wish to become paramedics. We award them $12,000. We give them about $7,000 before they start school to pay for that first part of school. Once they complete and pass their paramedic test, they get the other $5,000. They're still eligible for all our sign-on bonuses like any other employees. Um, the last year, we've had three EMTs. Oh, we've had more than that. Um, we've had five EMTs become paramedics in our region now. 
Um, we have three that are in the program. One of them actually just started on Monday morning. So it'd be two now left and six for the other numbers since the writing of this PowerPoint. So hopefully by the end of this fall, we're gonna have eight new paramedics in the last 16 months in our program. Our current staffing, we have one full-time supervisor in the area. We have one shared system-wide manager. We currently have 12 paramedics, now 13 paramedics um, in our area and 16 EMTs. And we're hoping to have another six, five paramedics by next fall now. How many of those are committed like to Pine Point? All of them. This is just staffing for our sandstone operations. Okay. Can that, does that give you then two people on at each of the three locations 24 hours a day? So right now in today's staffing, we staff our Pine City base 24 hours a day, our sandstone base 24 hours a day, and our Hinkley base is staffed 18 hours a day from 7 a.m. to 1 a.m. Our responses for the year. This is their last 10 years of physical data. So you can see the large up. Every year has kind of been a staircase up. In the last two years, we've had big leaps in our call volume. Is this where you're at right now in 2023? Nope, this is our physical year. So this has been done June 30th. Okay. okay. Um, and this year, the first quarter is it's on track to be very similar to last year, about 3% higher. Okay. So. This is the breakup where our 911 calls have happened. So about 40% of all our 911 responses happen in Pine City. Um, do know anytime I talk about a town during this, I'm talking about the zip code, not the physical boundaries of a city. Um, and I'm sure the board's very familiar with the aspect of how these zip codes are laid out in Pine County is very funky. Um, so Pine City, the zip code of Pine City at least, had 40% of all our responses for 911s, 26% were out in Hinkley, 19% in Sandstone, 15 in other towns throughout the area. Um, that 15%, the vast majority of them was Northern Pine County, um, with the exception of Henriette and Rush City. I think the only two zip codes that wouldn't be included in those numbers. This is a breakdown again. So we did about 106 calls up by Finlayson, 56 out in Brook Park, 46 in Graston, 33 Willow River, Bruno, Surgeon Lake, and they just keep going. So we actually did some mutual aid up in Duluth this last year as well. Our crews were up there on transport, dropping people off and there was calls pending up there. So we helped out in the area up there. This is our 911 destination. So 47% of all our patients we transport in the Sandstone region end up getting transported to the Sandstone Hospital. 39% end up going to Wellia Health over in Mora. 104 of those, um, or 4%, went up to Essential Health in Moose Lake. That is an area we're seeing the largest growth, I would say, in like destination transfer is patients in Northern Pine County wanting to go straight to Moose Lake. Um, and that's a little bit just how we change our coverage patterns too, that we're responding to more calls in the Northern part of Pine County. Grantsburg has been a popular destination. We did about 3% there. 3% went over to Cambridge. Um, Cambridge has gone down in years past, mainly because of the lack of inpatient mental health and OB care now. So those used to be specialties that we bring people to. And then we brought 27 patients either straight to Regions or straight to St. Mary's and Duluth. That'd be our trauma patients and our cardiac patients. They're having a heart attack that we can identify in the field. So our partnership, we have have formed an internal partnership between our Sandstone and Moose Lake operations. Um, we call this our I-35 EMS. Um, so we try to encompass all of our bases now. So the map up there, which the Moose Lake one didn't really outline very well, um, outlines kind of our layout. The change to that would be a Moose Lake is a 24 hour base of operations for us as well. We staff an extra 18 hour truck in Moose Lake every day from 11 a.m. to 5 a.m. Uh, we added that truck because of how many transports we were getting requested for across Minnesota. So instead of basing that truck in Duluth, for example, to do those, we figured in their downtime, they can help with 911 responses down here. Uh, we've changed our staging plan. Traditionally, our staging plan in the Sandstone operation was if we only had one truck available, they would move to Hinkley. Um, we actually looked at our run volume data to see like where is our need of our communities. Um, and we kind of developed the point system and a graphical layout to show better where we can put trucks to have the highest capture rate in the quickest times. So with that, one of the things that changed is we formed a handshake agreement with the city of Willow River. So we have um, a couple couches and a TV in their city hall now um, where crews can park and they can sit down and rest and get a little bit of a break. 
Our Willow River base is most times staffed by a Moose Lake crew coming down to cover the northern part of Pine County. Um, if the Moose Lake service area runs out of trucks due to 911 volume, though, we'll, we'll move our sandstone truck up to Willow River to cover that area. So combined with the two areas, though, 5,800 responses for the year. Uh, we staff five, ideally, paramedic ambulances every day. Um, we have eight physical ambulances in the area, so we have a few spares, ideally. I have one with a blown motor right now, so it's not really workable. Um, we do have two paramedic supervisors at Essentia. All our team leads, supervisors, managers, and directors are all paramedics as well, so we're available for responses. Underneath full staffing, it's about 60 total staff members and about 1,900 square miles of service area. And that is the end. You guys are busy. Do you, yeah. have, a, do you have a typical what response time, I guess, from the time a guy calls 911? What, what is the expected time? And I know mileage plays a difference, but is there, do you have a? So we require our crews to be in route to a call within two minutes currently from the time they are dispatched to the time they go in route. Um, starting June 15th and July 1st throughout our whole system, we actually started tracking the time a 911 call comes into a 911 center. Um, right now, though, I'm only able to get that data from Pine County and Carleton County. The other counties we serve, we don't know those numbers because we don't have access to their CAD system. Um, so that's one area we're really trying to find out, is there an area there we can improve our response times in? Um, currently, we're seeing times of anywhere from two minutes up to seven minutes before there are crews are being alerted to it. A lot of times, though, it's when someone calls 911, there's not a known need of an ambulance. A domestic disturbance call, it might be 45 minutes from the time a call is received till the ambulance is paged because the deputies haven't found the need of an ambulance until then. So those are kind of where we're struggling to find what's the best times to use. Right now, when we look at response times, we look at our en route time till the time the crew's on scene. Um, when we look at times, just to try and have a fair comparable across our system. Mr. Chair. Yeah. So, yeah. So, if you, how do you do your backfilling? You know, like if someone takes a transport or two transports are out, and then I've heard you get dispatched somewhere else if they're coming back from a hospital in the metro or whatever, and they send you some because they just need somebody close. And I understand all that. But we still have this big land mass in our jurisdiction. And, and I've just heard sometimes it takes a while to get an ambulance to some of our scenes and stuff. So I, I wish I would have included their staging plan in this report. It was an oversight on my part. Um, so when we look at transports, um, one thing we have changed is we used to, we have always kept one ambulance available for 911 response in Pine County. They might be assigned to 911 while they're the last truck available. But the caveat we always used to have was if it was a quote unquote emergent transfer, we'd use that truck for an emergent transfer. We've actually discontinued that now completely. Um, underneath ideal circumstances, I think we could do those again. The problem is it's so subjective what the word emergent is. Um, you being on a whole bunch of drips might be emergent to a local ED. But to me, you're in the hospital, you're safe, your condition's not going to change, that's not emergent. I don't need to leave a community without an ambulance. So that's why we've discontinued the practice of even asking if it's an emergent transport now. Um, and when we look at a response layout, we have uh, five levels of coverage for Pine and Carleton County, and it's pretty much how many trucks are available as a level number. So we have to have three on-duty ambulances available for us to take a transport out of the Sandstone Hospital up to Duluth. So if we went down to having two available ambulances, we would now have an ambulance in Moose Lake and our last truck here would be in Hinkley. And then if there's another 911 call that happens, depending on whose PSA it's in, if it's a call in Moose Lake, our last truck would move to Sandstone to cover both. Um, but our ideal thing is to try not to go below three. Thank you. So so then if if that happens and there's an accident on Highway 70, yep. that, that person has to wait for a truck to get from Sandstone to Highway 70. When it's a call that far south, frequently our crews will ask to call mutual aid. Um, and the big thing we want to hit home with our crews, though, is we want an ETA of the mutual aid resources. Um, we can get that ETA relatively easy with Canaba County because we can know where their trucks are coming from. When it comes to ambulance services that serve the southern part or south of Pine County and the county next door, they're dispatched by a secondary PSAP center, um, which will accept a call and page any truck in their system that's defined as the closest to them. Um, so the big reason that we still send our last truck and ask that ETA as we are finding some of those calls out on Highway 70 and the south part down by Rock Creek. Um, we're having an hour response time where we might have a 35 minute response time, which isn't great, but it's still better than waiting an hour for a mutual aid ambulance to come. I, I, that That's what I hear is, you know, I, we called an ambulance and it took 45 minutes for a guy to get here, you know, and, and, and if 
somebody's laying on the couch and you're trying to do CPR as best you can as a husband or wife or a kid, it, yep. that's a long, long time. And we try to, that's why we don't go below our three is our goal to not go below three. Because then by keeping at our level three status, it keeps us in a truck in Pine City, a truck in Sandstone, and a truck in Moose Lake. Um, so even if the truck is coming from Hinkley, the ideal response time to get down to the Pine City area is still about 15 minutes. Um, and the big one we want to hit home, though, we keep trying and trying to help recruit on these is the first responder groups getting out um, and being engaged and finding a best use to them. Um, we can have an ambulance to your house in six minutes, and most people will be really happy if you're bleeding out from a, an arterial bleed. But the six minutes is you're just less dead, so that point, you, unfortunately. How dependent are you on like the first responders then? When it's um, it depends on the service area and where we're at in the county. Um, some parts of Pine County, we have absolutely great responses from our first responder groups. Um, and I think a little of that's just because of the less call volume, like the northern part of Pine County, we have an absolute phenomenal um, first responder groups that serve up in the Willow River area and the Ascove area. But the call volume is way less. So when we look at like down in Pine City, we have 1,500 responses a year. For a volunteer to be woken up 1,500 times a year, that's that's pretty high, um, especially for a small group of two, three people. So one thing we wanted to work on um, in the future is, especially as the sheriff's office goes down the emergency medical dispatch route, is on those low acuity calls where there's not a critical need. There's an ambulance scene, but not a critical life-threatening need of maybe not waking those guys up at three in the morning. Just say when they are getting paid, it's the times that they truly, truly, we need their help right now. Um, and other communities have done this um, with a lot better success rate and getting higher responses. Good idea. So um, my district runs out to the way east part of Hinkley. So, you know, like being the reservation and the, the townships in that area. Yep. And what I keep hearing is that their wait times are always long. Um, it has, and I know that they have some first responders out there, but has anything changed then with the way that you've changed? There is a geographical, logistical, financial problem of the community out there um, that there's just not a financial way to put an ambulance out there. Um, I look at one of some of the townships, you know, they have two, 300 people at them. Um, and their fire departments aren't even serviced by fire departments that are inside of the state of Minnesota. So their fire departments don't want to cross the state line to first respond. Um, the other fire departments out there are having some issues having qualified people be EMRs to respond to calls. Um, and that's where those rural areas supporting their first responder groups and trying to get them education and get them equipment provided they're willing to do the work to do those things is the biggest key. Because I look out on the east side of Pine County, we do about 100 responses on a high volume year on those areas. Um, when you look at the other 4,800 responses, um, it's really hard to financially support a truck out there. It costs us about 800000 a year per truck. So one of the things that we've been hearing too or finding out is that it costs a lot for these people to get their education that they mm -hmm. need so that they can do the first responding or just be helpful. Is there any way that they can get financial help? There's a fair amount of financial assistance out there. Um, Pine County is part of Central Minnesota EMS, which does reimbursements for EMR programs mm -hmm. um, and EMR education. It's just they have to be willing to put the packet in to get the money back. Um, I've, I sit on the Pine County Mutual Aid Group and we've offered these services out many a times to people and the, the execution is what we're finding to be the hard part. Okay. Um, and I'm one guy, I can't write 14 people's grants every year for them. Is it hard to recruit the first responders too now? I would have a, one of the fire chiefs or first responder group leaders partake in that discussion more because I don't know. Um, I know me finding staff in the area is difficult. Um, How about for you guys? Very difficult. Um, very difficult for us to find staff. We've been trying to find EMTs that live in the community um, that are willing to go to paramedic school. That's been our best bet. Um, most of our EMTs actually are in Pine County or in the surrounding communities, which is really nice to see. It's really helpful for onboarding costs and learning what direction north is and south is, depending where you're at in the county. Um, those things seem really small, but that's a challenge from someone outside the area to learn. Um, and it's just a different demographic. Uh, one slide that's out there right now is from the state of Minnesota that shows the trajectory of EMS personnel in Minnesota. Um, last year, we lost 4,500 um, qualified EMTs and paramedics in the state of Minnesota that let their certification lapse to choose different careers. Um, and that wasn't our 40 and 40 year olds and older. This was our 20 and 30 year old population, which means this isn't the end of it. This is just the start. Um, so that's why we've been trying to really aggressively hire EMTs and get them trained, get them into paramedic school. Um, and that's where I'm pretty excited right now that we're going to have some paramedic or dual paramedic trucks coming up this winter, um, which will be the first time, I think, since Ascension has taken over the ambulance. Um, and definitely since 2015, we've had the ability to do that.
Any other questions? Any, any other questions, folks? Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Snake River watershed update. Snake River. Snake River. Snake River watershed. Did I go with the state? I got me too. So, a Snake River watershed. We um, it was a really interesting meeting, and one of the things um, we were asking about how we could dissolve, and what what was said was that we should probably look at withdrawing because the other counties are still uncertain as to where they want to go. The one watershed, one plan is taking effect at our next meeting, the end of this, or the, yeah, the end of September. Um, it was interesting when we talked about that, that we had enough people to make that joint powers work. And some of the commissioners that haven't signed on to it were surprised that they would have no vote in what was gonna happen on the one watershed, one plan. So that might make some movement happen there. Um, we asked um, Teresa where the finances were, and she had stated at that point that there was approximately $179,000 in the account. And she did state that if we asked to withdraw that we would get our share automatically. However, the GPA does not say, or the J, JPA does not state that. So then it, um, it came back, but um, over the, or I think it was last Friday, we got an update that there really is, instead of 179,000, there's $212,410.82 that is unencumbered. And Pine County share, if we withdraw, or if it's, if the, um, when the membership board is, um, dissolved, our share would be $43,544.21. So the numbers that she gave us was pretty far off, um, which is going to be one thing about the GPA or the JPA that's going to be really good is Pine County is going to be the fiscal um, responsibility for that. Mm -hmm. And we haven't been getting really good numbers from the one, mem one or the membership committee as to where the money is on that. Um, it's, you know, the responses are, there has been no changes since June, um, but we haven't been getting the numbers. So the fact that these numbers and the true numbers are so far off tells me that it's gonna be a good thing to have somebody else responsible for that. So what we are asking is, um, I think we're gonna go in and ask for it, for it to be dissolved is where the status is. Um, Aiken County is, starting to question it too and is on board with that and Mille Lacs may be there also. Um, Canabic County is meeting with John Cold today during their meeting to discuss what his opinion is for them to do. Um, the big thing is, is our share of the money. If we dissolve the committee, will we get our money back? And if we won't get our money back, then we may want to just look at withdrawing from the membership board as we're part of the one watershed, one plan joint powers agreement. So um, I don't know anything. Uh, sure, Mr. Chair, uh, Harry. I think the, the, the general sense that I get is once the, I got to check my notes because there's so many groups. Once the Snake River Watershed Plan Partnership, this is the one watershed, one plan implementation body. Once that starts up in September the 26th, the, there's no reason for the Snake River Watershed Management Board to continue to exist. And so, as Terry described, when we were at the last Snake River Watershed Management Board meeting, um, Terry had raised the issue of dissolution and the suggestion uh, was that, well, Pine County can leave if they want. And Teresa, who is the administrator of that group, sure made it sound like you could leave and take your money with you. She later followed up and said that the JPA is silent on that issue, but if it dissolves, the money is distributed based on a formula in the JPA. So at this point, it seems to make sense that if, if the Pine County Board wants to, to step out on this one, that you would consider a petition to dissolve the Snake River Watershed Management Board that would trigger the requirement for a public hearing by the Snake River Watershed Management Board and then the Snake River Watershed Management Board could approve or not approve a resolution of dissolution. And if it does that, then the end of story, everything works out well. If that doesn't, if at, at the point where the hearing has been held, the resolution has been presented and it fails, then I think Pine County would reconsider 
you know what the next step is, but there's no urgency uh, at this point to leave the agency and leave forty thousand dollars. Forty-three on the table. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Potential. That, that wouldn't make any sense. But so don't the two boards end up doing the same job? Why would you want? Why do you need two? Well, boards? the membership the job. would do less. Yeah, but it's like someone's going to be doing the job you would do. Right. So everything is duplicated. Your insurance is duplicated. All of your fees. So you're by, we pay Kaneva County um, money to um, administer it, and we pay them to be the financial administrators. So we'd be paying them duplicates, and we'd be paying for the one watershed, one plan. I mean, everything is duplicated. So, you know, that's the big question is why. And then the one watershed, one plan is going to be getting over a million dollars to spend. And this one only has $212 to spend on projects and they're not getting the projects. One watershed, one plan has some really good projects already in the works that they can jump on. So it makes no sense. It just doesn't. Mr. Chair. Yeah. So um, what was my understanding is that the watershed management board to dissolve, but they had to change a few things in the one watershed, one plan, because it is, is it like this was something that had to be done back in 93 when it was organized. And I thought I remember Bowser saying something about as long as we something with the one watershed, one plan, so it covered what the management board requirements were i guess yeah which I, it does so back in the early 1990s there was a citizen petition to create a watershed district and the counties at the time did not apparently want a watershed district and i i don't know this directly i just understand this is the history so um, those who lived it can correct me but the counties did not want a watershed district one of the reasons that I understand is that it would have levy authority. And so there was no interest in giving that district levy authority. So the counties worked together through an administrative law process to create this Snake River Watershed Management Board that Bowser then believed was responsive to the citizen petition. The citizens who filed that petition withdrew the petition and the Snake River Watershed Management Board has functioned since 1993. At a meeting of the Snake River Watershed Management Board or the policy committee, at one of those meetings previously, Bowser was asked that direct question as to whether there would be, if dissolving the Snake River Watershed Management Board would allow a citizen petition to form a watershed district. Bowser's answer was a citizen petition can be filed at any time to form a watershed district. The Snake River Board didn't prohibit that. The new board won't prohibit that. What Bowser evaluates when a petition is filed is, is there actual comprehensive water planning being done in the district? And if there's effective comprehensive water planning in the district, that is the best defense against forming a, forming a watershed district. Does that, Josh, does that? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I was just, I couldn't remember exactly what it was that there was some requirements which the one watershed, one plan fits that plan. And so as of a couple of weeks ago, all of the, local units of government, excuse me, all of the counties and all of the soil and water conservation districts that have land within the Snake River watershed, except for Chisago County, had approved the plan. And Chisago County and Isani County are, are minor, minor players. They have not been involved in the Snake River board because there's virtually no land area. So I wanna discount those, right? Yeah. So in essence, everybody who's a player has approved the plan, five of the eight jurisdictions have approved the new joint powers uh, for the Snake River Watershed Plan Partnership. And that's the four SWCDs and Pine County. The counties of Aiken, Mille Lacs, and Kennebec have not approved the JPA. Some of them might in, you know, between now and September 26, some of them might not. 
interesting to me anyways, is that Mille Lacs County is not a member of the joint powers for the Rum River watershed. So to me, that just, that speaks less to anything we are doing or have done and more to how Mille Lacs County views its role in watershed planning uh, under this new one watershed, one plan system. When the Rum River is huge through their county, yeah. where um, Snake River is not. Yeah. So, I mean, that's kind of the difference with that too. The other thing that I thought was really interesting with the last meeting is we've got the Citizens Advisory Committee and they had not been really excited because they're going to lose their voice. We're not going to have, their, their committee won't be anymore either than if we go to just the one watershed, one plant joint powers board. And at the last meeting, they were actually happy about some of the things that are coming on with the one watershed, one plan, and the fact that they will still be sought after for their opinions and stuff. And um, they're very supportive of having this taken care of and, and being done. So I thought that was good, good stuff. Which right now on the Citizen Advisory Committee, SWCDs are on that. Right. But, SWC, but the Citizen Advisory Committee they recommend to the policy board, but they don't have a vote. So right. they can recommend whatever they want and the policy board can do whatever they want. Right. So essentially they're gonna gain a little bit more of a voice. Um, yes. Just the lake associations and the, the well, whatever. Yes, WCDs. Yeah, right. they will, and, and they're there. I mean, they're the boots on the ground. I right. mean, they, it just makes no sense. They're the icebergs. I just don't understand why you wouldn't be part of it if you were in a county. That wouldn't be, I don't either. So, and that question I think has come up at almost every meeting since, it, since they have made the statement, we will not be part of the one watershed, one plan if we cannot have a place at the table. And I think at every meeting since that was stated, that question has come back. Are, so are you stating that you would not be <laughs> active in this in this committee if you don't have a spot at the table? And and why would you not be? You know, And it's the same answer all the time, but it's always asked. and and you know, their, their remark is, why would we do all of this work and, you know, um, bring all this stuff together if we're not going to have a say in what and how it's going to be done, which makes sense because they are the, the, the ones with the knowledge. So. so does anybody have any other questions as far as the committee itself or, and where things are at or any? No, thoughts? I think I think you've kept us well informed and. We'll keep scratching our head until you get it done. So we do need to um, consider making a motion to petition the Snake River Watershed Membership Board for dissolution under Section X of the Joint Powers Agreement, and then um, consider the appointment of the representatives and the alternate to the Snake River Watershed, which um, would be myself as the member and Josh, if you'll still agree to be the, the alternate. Mm -hmm. Is that a motion? I will make that motion, yes. Or do they need to you be- You want to do them as, as separate ones because yeah. we'll convey the one of them to the Snake River Watershed okay. Management Board. So I'll make a motion to file a petition to the Snake River Watershed Management Board for dissolution under Section X of the Joint Powers Agreement. I'll second. Okay, we've got a motion by Lovegren, seconded by Moore for, uh, to petition uh, for dissolution. Addition. What Just you understand yeah. <laughs> uh, of the uh, Snake River Management Board. Any discussion? Yeah, do we want to put something in there with the as of the monies owed or anything, or wouldn't that not be necessary right now? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, yeah, I, I don't think it's necessary because under the joint powers, the uh, refund of the money is spelled out. Yes. And so if it dissolves, each county gets its fair share based on the formula in the, the joint powers. Gotcha. Thank you, David. Any other questions? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, then we have, should formally appoint uh, Commissioner Lovegren as a representative and Commissioner Moore is our alternate to the, uh, which will be the newly formed Snake, Snake River, River Watershed Plan Partnership. Yeah. I'll move that, Mr. Chair. Okay. I'll second it. Uh, 
Motion by Ludwig, seconded by Lovgren. Any discussion? Not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, thanks, Terry. We'll move on to reports. Uh, Malax Band meeting. I'm trying to remember. Um, actually, it was an interesting meeting. Jamie, Jamie's back, yeah. <laughs> and so um, Jamie had been out for a while. He had been pretty sick, and um, it was good to see him and hear him and just have him be a part of everything again. We're talking about legislative things that we need to get working on. Um, we're still working on qualified expert witnesses for ICWA. Um, we might have some leads, maybe. Um, we're going to be having a meeting, is that next Monday, um, to talk about what to do with the extension and kids and um, how to work with them, like expand on that. And so um, we talked a little bit about that meeting that's coming up too. And then there's another meeting that we're hoping to have this month that's going to involve where they are with their initiative program. And um, what's the other one? Maybe that was- Initiative tribe. And yeah. We've, we've talked about probation. Yes. Is that what you're thinking? We've, well, and yeah. So there's a couple of different things that are coming up um, with that, but we're gonna meet with their human service department to talk about the initiative tribe and see where they're at with that and how we can help get that going faster or get going. No. <laughs> get going at all. <laughs> Are they seriously pursuing doing a probation department? Uh, I don't think so. They, I think one of the big questions that came with that is, I think they have to do it for all of their counties. They can't just say, okay, we work really good with Pine, so we're going to do this with Pine County, and we're going to do this with Mille Lacs, and we're going to do this with Aiken. So they have to figure out where they're at so that they can do it. I think I think staffing is their biggest fear. Yeah. How would they staff it? Yeah. Snake River Watershed Manage, I don't think we need to talk about that anymore, do we? We did that. We kind of beat that one up. Yeah. Land and zoning. I missed that, Mr. Chair. Uh, Lower St. Croix, we did not have a meeting between our last. And we haven't met this. We didn't meet this month. Technology was canceled in a month. HRA EDA. Yes, we had that meeting. Um, it was a general meeting for the two. Uh, facilities they're managing and then it kind of jumps into the HRE part of it and um, they had the audit presentation and which was unmodified um, and we knew there had been some questions in the past and um, he issued two findings uh, I think it was documentation of expenditures and segregation of duties were I think they were so um, it's in good hands right now compared to where it was so and then um, they, the board approved uh, to move forward with a purchase agreement on the North Court apartment buildings that have those site-based vouchers. So we'll see where that ends up. I think there's going to be a walkthrough and some negotiation and things like that. Other than that, I don't know. It's pretty much a general meeting. Would you say, JD? Yeah. Yeah, there, there's a little talk about they still didn't get the appraisals done on the two buildings yet that they, Sandstone and Finlayson, remember we had first. Oh, the, yeah, the alarm or the entry thing? Well, the appraisals of the the value of the building. Oh, the value still of that, the book? Yeah, yeah, that still has not been. I know there was discussion yeah. early on when. The, the value for the capital asset value for the audit. Yeah. Yeah, that. So we're. That's a that's a number that the auditors need to, in essence, reconstruct as best they can from the limited historical records that they got from the previous management company. Yeah, it's assets part of the. Yeah, but no matter other than that, that sounds everything I recall. Uh, schools, counties, meeting. We met in Hinkley. Um, it was interesting hearing what the school's concerns were. 
um, with the legislative things that happened and what it was going to do to them and cost them. And um, they're in the same boat we are. They're being told what they have to do, but they're not going to be getting all the money that they need to justify it and to do that. And they talked about the projects that they were doing. Um, Steph from East Central said that we should go play on their playground because it's fun. They just got a new playground there. Um, so they were pretty excited about the kids. Um, Joe talked about Pine Technical College and what possibilities are for financing kids with that. Um, there's still some more to learn as to where that's gonna go, but um, we were talking about how little it would actually take to still participate maybe in meals for the kids or something, you know, um, just to help make it easier for the kids to go to the school. Um, Cause we don't have the money for ARPA anymore. We just did our last, our last orientation this year. Um, what else did we talk about? Well, uh, staffing, staffing at yeah. the schools. At, of course, this was almost a month ago or right. three weeks ago, and so they had they had a hard time. They had a lot of openings, um, and hopefully, they got them full by today. Yeah. But uh, it's a struggle uh, nationwide. If you watch the news. You know, one thing that we were talking about, um, too, is I think that a lot of the standards have been lowered is, you know, we'll take people that have this capability and then um, we'll do training. And I think that the schools are running into that, too, as to who they can take to teach and what they'll do to help get them the certification that they need to teach. I believe that's my assumption from some of the things that I've seen. But, um, you know, and we were talking about that with probation and what um, Ramsey County is doing for their probation officers. I think that we're finding with the staff shortages, there's a lot of that kind of stuff going on. So it'll be interesting to see. Yeah, is that, a, is that which programs or did they say is most affected by that? No. Mm -hmm. Any other? I do. Yep. We had uh, we we moved uh, Kettle River one more watershed planning back to or the, the, because of time constraints on some other issues, but we approved our management structure last week. Okay, so it's, it's going to be a joint powers collaborative, and uh, Kanawha County supported, Aiken County supported, Carlton supported, so. It's nice that you all work together. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, that's what everybody says. <laughs> everybody, they, they asked Debbie the CD representation. That's exactly what they said. This, this works so good and we're going to work so good together. And then right. it's just going to be deciding the, you know, let the, let the experts run the show. And then we policy committee, limited meetings, and they, they know what they're doing. Right. Yeah. Any other, other? I have a couple other yep. others. So one that I forgot to talk about when we were talking about the um, Mille Lacs band is the tribal sales tax. And um, we were asking them for help with legislative and, and brainstorming as to who we could get to support that. Right now, the tribes can um, collect sales tax. They get to keep 50% and 50% because the state of Minnesota and out of that 50%, the state keeps 40 and we get 10. Yep. And we're asking for 50-50 of the state's share. So um, we talked with Jamie was really excited about getting on that bandwagon and helping us in that. And then we talked about that with AMC also. And um, we will see where that goes, but that would be nice to get some extra cash from, from that um, as we're the ones that do the work through the tribal lands and not the state. So we deserve that, right? Um, the other thing is, is that I had received a phone call from Terrell Clark from Stearns County asking um, if I would send a personal invitation to Pete Stauber to have him come and meet with us. And it would be through the, the group, the Minnesotans for American Communi Community Survey or the census, um, because we know that the census is really important to what services we get in our areas, um, especially you know, the past couple of years, it's been all done online or a lot of it's been on the, online because of COVID and we know that we have horrible Wi-Fi. And so a lot of our people were not able to answer or respond to those, which is going to affect us financially for a lot of the programs that we have. And we talked about um, Central on Aging and um, Steve was able to talk to him about that. Um, he's on that committee with Terrell. 
Um, but we did meet with Pete and it was a good meeting and he he's agreed to host a meeting with other congressional members about the importance of the census and, and what we can do um, to support our citizens to get that done. So um, that'll be coming, I wanna say, is it this month or October? Uh, they were trying to get it done before November. Right, so yeah. I haven't heard where they're at with that. So what they were going for was accomplished. It was a good meeting. So how, yeah, how does that work when, you know, they did the census? Right. And then Dave, you've touched on this when I asked this question a week or so ago, but I don't know if I got it all. But then, then there's this follow-up stuff that happens, these surveys and this boots on the ground. And I had, it lit my phone up for a while because they thought it's like scamming us. You know, they don't, they, I don't know, they weren't wearing credentials or who was working or what was happening, but. They, they've, it's something they've done for what, a hundred years. Um, yeah, but how does but that it's, it's, data come in? How late, is that to fine tune the data? That from that the original what? census, you know? What are they looking to gather there? They're looking to gather all the the data for um, trends in an area is it aging is it younger people is it immigrants is it what whatever that, that's really what they're looking for is are those trends i think oh I'm not, looking, I'm not saying i'm anti this i'm trying to understand for, it. so is it do they add numbers to the census in the end if they so it has nothing to do with the numbers this, no, it does have something to do with the numbers because there are some people that get missed and they got a mathematical uh, statistical grid that says if they call X amount of people and they get X amount of responses more than they got out of the census, that means that they missed 5% of the people in that geographic area to get counted. Okay. And so... Uh, what what we're concerned about, what we should be concerned about is that we get all the people counted in rural Minnesota that actually live here because that's how the funds are distributed. And especially in our area where we know our population is aging. And so if we don't, if we don't, have a good accurate count of the people over age 60, then we're going to get less money yeah, I get that. to all those older American Act dollars to help those people with programs that are designed to help those people. So so how do they count the homeless? How do they count what? Homeless. Homeless? They don't have a that's address. another that's another count that they do. That's a uh, they do that, I believe, on a certain day in February. That's a that's that's a whole different thing. If I understand it right. Yeah, I and I know. I, I think. <laughs> thank you. I've, if if we want to understand how the Census Bureau counts people, we should invite them, right? Because yeah. they'll they'll give us more information than we know. The American Community Survey is an annual survey that is a, I don't know if it's like a million or a three million or some, some relatively small number that asks all kinds of questions about demographics, income, et cetera, et cetera. And this group that uh, reached out to Terry to coordinate that meeting with uh, Congressman Stauber is focused on increasing the response to the American Community Survey and increasing the number of surveys that are distributed because that survey is a statistical model that if you're in rural areas like Pine County, you may not get enough responses to be uh, sign statistically significant and you, you either get missed or you can't do the breakout of, well, what is this township versus that township because there's no responses or too few responses. And so it was It was fascinating to get to learn a little bit about that, but it's complex enough that I don't, I can't today sit here and explain um, exactly. But we do know that when we apply for grants, like that broadband grant that we got, where we had to go and identify all the, low, the LMI areas, because that's where the broadband had to go, that all comes out of the census and the communities, the American Community Survey. 
yeah, I think I, I get it. It's a good data, but it's just how do they know? You know, they're missing people. We have homeless people all over the place, and we don't even know where they, who they are. So how do they find them? I, and I know it's not part of that one, but it's yeah, certain the people it, we have to serve and, and I, take care of. Somebody has determined that uh, they're statistically not a big enough number. I guess I don't know. You'd have, like David said, you'd have to ask them. Yeah. Thank you. Any other other? I just want to say, I think it speaks volumes that they would reach out to Pine County and ask us to do a personal invite because they know that we have a good relationship with our representatives. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, I did too. Thanks, yeah. Terry. Any other business? If not, we'll declare the meeting adjourned and we'll meet in two weeks. So. Thank you.